We'll start recording in, you ready, Kim? Yep, yep. Okay, three, two, one. This Hello, everyone. Recorded. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Quillen with the Chicago Tribune. And on behalf of Cebu, welcome to today's session on shooting photos and video for business stories. Mitch Maslin has put together a terrific presentation for us. Mitch is an Arkansas-based editorial photographer, multimedia specialist, and educator. He currently is a photojournalist at the Arkansas Democrat Gazette in Little Rock. Previously, Mitch was a multimedia journalist at the Mansfield News Journal in Mansfield, Ohio. He also worked as a staff photographer at Beijing-based True Run Media, publisher of three lifestyle magazines. He taught photography courses at the Wutong and Adelaide, two Beijing-based culture and art education centers. Before we jump in, one quick point of business. To our listeners, if you have a question for the panel, please email it to sabu at sabu.org. That's S-A-B-E-W at S-A-B-E-W dot O-R-G. Those questions are going to be forwarded to Mitch so that he can address them. So once again, sabu at sabu.org. With that, I will hand things over to Mitch. Mitch? Uh, thank you, Kim. Hello, everybody. Um, We'll just go ahead and get right on to this. Um, as far as talking about the photos and videos from the you heard earlier from Kim, um, I'm hoping we can get through most of the still and some of the other compositions and some of the other techniques we, we will talk about with still photography. I don't know if I'll have time to get into video. That'll be at the end. I didn't really set up specifically something for video. Um, we can actually do another webinar later if they'd want to because that would take an entire hour. But today... The focus will mainly be on stills. A lot of these things we'll talk about can be applied to video. Um, even the lighting section we'll talk about. So um, these composition techniques, some of the things we'll talk, we'll talk about doing before and after and during the shoot, um, you can apply this to video as well. Um, but we won't get too much into the technique of shooting video. Just like with this one, we won't get too much into the technique of shooting stills. Um, but let's just go ahead and get right into it. Um, let's see. Some of the assumptions I have before doing this talk of you guys is that most of you are reporters, not photographers. Um, photography, for the most part, is an afterthought to make your articles better or to sell better. Um, generally, people, when they want an article, they want at least one or two photographs to go with it as well. Um, so this is something that you guys have to do, but you don't really want to do it. Uh, most, if not all, of your content is business-related, and most of it, if not all, will be along the lines of environmental portraiture, um, industry factory related and press conferences. Today we'll focus on portraiture specifically, but again, like I said, most of the techniques we'll discuss can be applied to anything you do as far as, you know, shooting factories, shooting press conferences, things like that. And most of, not all of you even don't even have a camera. You might be shooting with your iPhone, but you're limit, you have a limited or no budget for extra gear and you're generally limited with time during the shoot. If you're going to go into an interview, most of the focus is going to be asking questions and getting the subject to talk. Then you might have 10, 15 minutes at the end to take a couple of photos um, to enhance your uh, your article. I keep forgetting I got to click rather than go down. Um, so for the outline, things we'll, I'll talk about is what you can do before, during, and after the shoot uh, with your subjects. Uh, we'll talk about three different techniques for getting better images: composition, lighting, and posing. Um, I'll go into some smartphone tips specifically for shooting, and then um, at the end of each questions, I'll generally stop, to, or each section, I'll generally stop and ask if you guys have any questions regarding what we just talked about. Or like she said, you can actually email them in, and I can answer them at the break of each little section. Um, so some of the things you can do before you even show up for the interview or the shoot research. Obviously, all of you will be doing this before you even get there. You'll be doing research on your subject, thinking about what questions you ask. You probably even have, let's say, half to if not more of the article already finished in your head. Um, it's the same kind of way for photography. As soon as I know who um, I'm going to shoot, I'll start looking them up and do a quick Google search on the subject. You know, what are their interests? What do they like? What do they don't like? What do they have to do? Um, the company itself, um, where the company is as well. Um, because that will kind of help me plan, think about sometimes even if I know the building layout and I know what direction is facing as far as maybe the office, I can plan on north, south, east, west because of the direction of light even before I go there. 
um, but to have some kind of idea of what you're getting into and what you can work with. So when you're doing the research, you want to do maybe an image search or an image research on um, what has already been shot or what does the building look like, what does the subject look like. You know, if he's tall, if short, she, he, you know, big, small, um, what hobbies they have, what, you know, they like to look about, because that will kind of help you think about how you're going to shoot them and what logistical concerns you might have when you encounter during the shoot. Um, if your time is flexible with the meeting time, I always try to do it for early morning or late afternoon. The main reason is just light. Um, if you're not going to be setting up your own lights and doing like a huge studio setup with, you know, the umbrellas and all things like that, um, and you're just dealing with natural light, a.k.a. the sun, um, if you can plan it for the early morning or the late afternoon, that's when you'll get the more directional light. So that will help your portraits be at least a little bit better rather than having to shoot in like the noon, harsh noon light, which is not the best for just about anything. So if you can plan the meeting time, try to early in the morning or later afternoon, because that way when you get there, you'll have better light to work with. Um, before and during the shoot, you want to show up 15 to 20 minutes early. I at least I like to do that. Um, because this will allow for scouting. You know, if you get there and they're like, oh, you know, they're still in the meeting, you'd be like, that's okay. I don't, we can meet at the exact time. I just like to, you know, walk around, get a sense of the place, ask them, you know. Um, you can always ask for suggestions too. Generally, depending on how up the ladder the person is, you'll probably be in contact with somebody, okay. either the assistant or somebody from the PR marketing department. Um, so you can ask them for suggestions. Oh, you know, do you know any good spots in the building where, you know, we might be able to take some portraits of him or him or her. Um, so I generally like to walk around, you know, take a look, take a look at the light, um, try to find five or six spots that can work for the portraits. So I do this before I even have to sit down with them. So I have some kind of idea of what I can work with or what I don't have to work with, depending on, you know, the, where you are. And again, sometimes what access you can get to. Maybe if you want to do something where you're going up to the top of the building or into an area that requires like some extra pre-authorization, you can say, oh, you know, I really like to go into here. But, oh, we have to clear with security. Well, can you do that? And then we'll go do the interview, and hopefully somebody will be able to clear it or, you know, something like that afterwards. And you'll be able to get, you know, the right hard hat if you need to go someplace or the right, you know, clearance um, to go into a place that you might not have access to just, you know, at the spot at the moment when you want to walk around and take photos. So try to get there early. Try to scout five or six spots so that can work. And shoot test. You know, again, if you're escorted with the PR marketing department person, Ask them to sit down real quick. You know, if they don't want to do it, you know, you just shoot a test of the actual scene and see how the light falls, see what, oh, all right, I have to put this chair, rotate this this way, I have to remove this, things like that. But getting there before you actually talk to the person will help, you know, afterwards, because you'll see when I go into the next slide, what you go, um, generally what you want to do is shoot after you um, interview the person. So during after, like I said, do the shoot after, okay, because during the interview you can establish rapport. Hopefully the interview is going good and you didn't ask any questions that made them mad or, you know, not in a willingness to be uh, photographed afterwards, but you at least establish some sort of relationship, some sort of rapport with you so they become comfortable around you and comfortable with you, you know, using the camera. Um, Again, during the interview, you can discover things that you can use afterwards. Oh, if they have a specific hobby or they have a specific place in the building or something that they like to do, you can find that out, put them in there. Um, you need to plan time for this, okay? If you arrive 10 to 15 early minutes early to scout, you generally like to have at least 10 to 15 minutes afterwards. And again, if you only have one hour or half an hour, you're going to have to kind of set a timer to make sure you have that time afterwards. Um, if... Again, you're not used to doing this. The more times, the better. You know, you can crunch something out in one or two minutes, but the, ob the obvious, you know, way is to get 10 to 15 minutes so you can have more time and even 20, 30 minutes if you could to set something up and, you know, to make the in image more visually interesting. Um, before we go on to anything about questions as far as before or after, things like that, I don't see anything coming in over the email. Um, so that, again, is what you can do to better, I guess, you know, I always like to say I like to pre-visualize everything. So before I even go and see the person or see the place, I always have things running through my head. I'm sure if you're reporters and you're writers, you're kind of doing the same thing where you have already have a certain set of questions you're going to ask or you have a certain idea of what, you know, the story is already going to be like. And so you can get your photographs to actually enhance that by just doing some thinking before you actually talk to the person. 
Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on. Um, so the three different things we're going to talk about with composition specifically will be um, foreground and background, rule of thirds, and point of view. Um, there was a few more, but we kind of changed it in the uh, in the uh, test run because uh, there seemed to be a, I think a little bit too much, and I didn't want to overwhelm you. Um, so three of these things, you know, they're pretty easy to understand, and these can be applied again pretty much to still or video. Uh, some of the important points with the composition, um, strong photographs incorporate more than one of the previous techniques. Okay, Don't just think about background, don't, don't just think about foreground and background as one element, or rule of thirds when we talk about it as one element. Um, if you want to train yourself, you can always just say, oh, today I'm going to work on back, foreground and background. So your shots to be today, or your shots when you're going into that, can just be specifically on that one point, foreground and background. And then, okay, oh, today I'm going to work on rule of thirds. So I'm going to position my subject along the rule of thirds. I'm going to follow that. But once you start to get these down and it becomes like muscle memory and you start to really think about these in your shots, then you try to combine more more of them together because a strong photograph will incorporate, like I said, more than one of those techniques we talk about. Everything else in the frame should enhance your understanding of the person photograph. So if we're talking about environmental portraits or even like a press conference when somebody's talking, generally if they're a good marketing and PR department, they're going to have something behind them or to the side or to, you know, something around them that will enhance or be what they're actually talking about. So when you're thinking about portraiture, you want to think about everything in the background. Generally, when we talk about foreground, background, we have subject and the things around them. Anything in the frame should enhance your understanding of the person photograph. If it doesn't, take it out. Now, with editorial photography, you have a little bit more leeway, especially with portraiture, um, as far as what you want to stage, meaning what you want to take out and what you want to put in. Because portraiture, you have a little bit more leeway than if you're doing spot news, you know, or feature stuff where you want everything to be very, you know, organic and naturally happen. Portraiture, you have a little bit more leeway. So if there's a tree or a branch or even, you know, a chair, somebody, a window, whatever that's in the frame that you don't need or don't want, just take it out. Everything in there should enhance and give you a better understanding of the person in there. There's no set rules to any of these composition techniques. They can be broken, um, but these are just guidelines and they're really good things to follow and think about and they're pretty easy to think about while you're shooting. So with foreground and background, okay, we talk about environmental portrait. The background in general provides the context. That's the environment part of the environmental portrait. The foreground provides focus. That is the portrait part of the environmental portrait. Okay, so standard general portraiture, you have in the foreground your subject. You want them prominent, you want them bigger because that's where the focus is. And everything in the background, everything around them is the environment, again, that enhances what or who they are. Um, a lot of times you can think layers with this. Don't just think about one or two, foreground and background. You can have foreground, middle ground, you can have the subject, the background. You can have foreground and then something in the front, subject. And then you can have something behind the subject and something way behind the subject. So foreground, subject, middle ground, background. You can even have the subject way in the middle, in the front, excuse me, subject, middle ground, background. So think about different layers. You know, not just one or two. You can think about three or four or five different layers. Something that will kind of move the eye around and give more interest to the uh, person being photographed. Here we'll just look at some examples. This, again, was a press conference for, I believe, you know, a new recycling program. So guy is talking. Again, he's right there in the foreground. You got right in the background. It's very obvious to, to see who this guy works for, what they're going to be kind of talking about. You have the big bold letters there, think green, think clean. Um, he's right down there in the foreground. <clears throat> so it gives a good sense of what's going on and what is around in the image. Again, foreground focus, background context. Here, it's a simple portraiture. Guy is really forward and you're right up there. It's almost larger than life kind of looming there. Um, very in the foreground. Again, the background, you can see it looks like he's in his home. Um, if you, you heard in the introduction, I'm from, um, I, based, I was based out in China for a lot of, long time, so you can see way in the top left corner there, you can see Mao, you know, the statue of Mao that's ubiquitous um, with a lot of the old residents. But you can see a little bit of his character, of the context of his house in the background. But again, the focus is mainly on him looking right at the camera there in the foreground. So all everything in the background, and like I said, these placements of him and the guy before, at least he, I, he couldn't move, but I could move to put him in that exact position. Here, I was able to move him to get, when we talk about lighting a little bit later on, to get him in the right light, to get him in the right position so I can show as much of the background around there. 
um, to give more information about him. Here, again, it's pretty straightforward. You know exactly what this person is by looking at what he's doing and what's in the background. Okay, you got his scrubs, you know, he's got the pen there, and then behind him are all his files. Um, now, with the files, there were, um, and again, with a lot of these photographs, I'll try to some throw in some anecdotal um, things that happened while I was, you know, photographing the subjects. With him, these the um, uh, his assistants were concerned about HIPAA law because with the files behind him, you could get information about, you know, a lot of the, uh, his patients. But because of the technique and the stuff that I was work, the kind of lens I was working is, I was actually actually able to blur the background image, and with that. Um, Again, I actually had to show them the image afterwards so they would be okay with me photographing it because I was like, look, he's sharp. If you look at the background, the backgrounds are kind of all blurred out. So they were okay with me photographing him in this um, set. Now, again, foreground, background, very simple. When we talk about rule of thirds, he actually will follow along some of the rule of thirds as well. Um, okay, so real quick, one question I just saw that came in is how much should I clean up a person's desk and is having a pewter in the background a cliche? Um, it's cliche, but there's generally nothing wrong with the cliche. I wouldn't take the computer off because it kind of looks really bad. Um, if you looked at a recent photo of they did of Trump working during the, um, uh, what is it, the, uh, I wouldn't say breakdown, what just happened? <clears throat> well, yeah, it was the shutdown, excuse me, <laughs> not breakdown, shutdown. During the uh, government shutdown, they had a photo of Trump working. If you looked at that photo, that is not how you stage a photograph. It is really great because his desk completely cleared. His phone is up to his hand, but he's not talking into the phone. He's looking directly at the camera. So um, that's a perfect way of how not to stage a photograph, and that was an official White House um, photograph. But desk in the background, I... Computer, no, it's not cliche. I mean, if that's all you have to work with, you'll see when I go through one of my other um, uh, shoots where I, I'll go step by step. Um, I don't try to avoid the desk, but if that's all you have to work with, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing cliche. I mean, you always, uh, like I always say, you try to get five or six different shots. So, yes, give them the desk. Um, as far as cleaning it up, uh, it depends if it's... I mean, if it's, uh, you know, CEO, uh, you probably want to relatively clean. If it's, you know, like this doctor's desk was full of a lot of these files just piled up. That, uh, to me, enhances it. So, I mean, you can, you know, you find a balance between, like, it looking really cluttered and bad. Again, it depends on the person who you're trying to photograph. But um, most of the time, if, you know, they're in a decent office, they'll, you know, be clean. But uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the computer. But just make it look natural if you're going to be looking to work in that White House shot was it's a really it's a good master class on how not to make a photograph you look for that um shot there it's, it's actually really fascinating how they staged it um all right so let's go on the next one we're going to talk about is rule of thirds um what basically the rule of thirds is is it divides the frame into nine equal segments using two horizontal and two vertical lines position elements along these lines are points where they intersect okay so it's like a tic-tac-toe except for square or excuse me a horizontal frame or vertical frame rather than just a square and i have a um a, a grid so you can show this um, with the rule of thirds it adds balance and interest and it is pleasing to the eye um again they call it the rule of thirds but rules are meant to be broken you don't always have to place something along those lines for it to work but you can understand once you start doing it when you do it to see before and after where something is not on the rule of thirds and something is it just feels better it looks better it feels better there's something about it being balanced um, with the rule of thirds on there okay. some of the tips is um, you can do with the rule of thirds is place a horizon on the line so if you're having a horizon on your um, shot you want to place that on the bottom third or the top third generally it's going to be the bottom third if you have a lot of sky um, you don't want to put it like dead center as far as the horizon legs horizon line um, person their head or the eyes should line up so either have the person or if it's a closer shot of their head or if even tighter shot of their face the eyes should fall along one of those lines or the points where, these, where they intersect um, some cameras have a grid option so you can actually turn this on and even your iphone i believe has a grid option and that when it divides into those nine squares that's actually along the rule of thirds so here you can see a kind of a before and after um, 
the one on the left is just dead center. Nothing wrong with it. It looks fine. But when you look at the one on the right, where they have the afterwards placed along that intersection, the bottom right of those rule of thirds, it just looks more pleasing. You know, that's basically, you know, it, it's hard to tell, like, you know, what really is why. I mean, it actually has to do with our frame of reference going back to the Renaissance and some of the things that went on there. But um, it just feels better. It feels more pleasing. Um, and again, if you kind of cover up the right side and just look at the image with the dead on, it doesn't look bad, but when you see it in relationship to the right side, where it's placed along the rule of thirds, it just feels a little bit better. Here, the same shot from before. Not only do we have foreground, background, you can see that person right there is on that bottom left intersection of the rule of thirds. Okay, Those lines, the reflective strips on the left and right of him, and then the one line that kind of divides from the numbers down, that intersects directly on him. That wasn't by chance. <laughs> I saw those intersecting lines and I directed those lines to put him right there because not only did they fall on the rule of thirds, but they also guided the eye visually directly to him. The think green, the think clean, that's kind of like on that top section, you know, along, if you put like the think clean, that top part of the rule of third line will kind of fall almost right there. So again, this was a completely different a deliberate action to put him along those lines of the rule of thirds. And so you have the rule of thirds, you have the foreground and background. Um, two of those things kind of going on with this. It's still, it is what it is. It's just a press conference shot. There's not much you can do about it. But at least visually when somebody is looking at this, there won't be any awkwardness or unsteady or uneasiness to the shot. It's going to look pretty general, pretty pleasing to the person actually viewing it. Here, again, this falls along a few different lights. You have the lights up at the top that are on the top line. He is on the, the bottom line of that rule of thirds. Again, if you take a grid and overlay it, the lights with him fall on that, that right vertical line. The lights you know, on the left fall on the left vertical line. So again, if you take this and divide this into nine equal segments, all of that kind of falls on to the rule of thirds. Again, you have foreground, middle ground, background. You have him kind of in the foreground are the chairs. The middle ground is that, you know, the stadium seating of the theater and the background of the lights. So it gives, you know, an idea, you kind of know where he is um, and the way he's kind of posed and his attitude with the goatee. Um, you know, he's probably a director of something in a theater or, you know, um, something to that effect. But, um, yeah, all that kind of falls, again, you have the rule of thirds and the foreground, middle ground going on um, to just make it for a very solid composition. Here, um, Foreground, middle ground, background, rule of thirds, the guy generally over there falls right into that line of the rule of thirds. His head's probably near that top intersection. Um, but there's here, there's also a lot of movement going on. You start, your eye kind of starts at the bottom at that big pan, like in the foreground. It moves up to his face, which is in the middle ground. Then it kind of circles back around to all the things that are in the back. So there's almost like a secular, and we, we don't talk about this here, but there's a, a triangle effect that you can do with your images. So your eye kind of bounces from the bottom center up to his face and then up to the back where the letters are and then kind of back down. So there's a movement in a triangle um, that's going on and is forming a, a lot of movement throughout the images. But again, he's placed along, you know, those intersection lines, the one pole is based on the other third, you know, rule of third vertical line. Um, so you have all those things kind of going on that are incorporating it into that one image there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, um, the last one we're going to be talking about a little bit is called point of view. Point of view is the position from which the camera sees the scene. Okay, so again, you have, I say, the position where the camera sees the scene. It's from where the camera sees the scene, not from where you see the scene. The world is not always on eye level. Okay, um, you shouldn't always just shoot, put the camera up to your eye take a picture and kind of forget about it. You want to get to make things more interesting. You always want to try to get a different angle. Um, but when you tips for shoot when you're shooting portraiture is if you're shooting from eye level, okay, if you're shooting your subject, I should say, so your camera and the subject's eyes and your eyes are at eye level, there's an immediate emotional connection to that. And you see that with a lot of portraiture. If you look at just straightforward portraiture, you'll see if it's just the face or the eyes or the upper body generally the camera will be directly at eye level, okay? Because there's an immediate emotional connection you have to the subject like that. If you shoot from below, meaning you are below, and the subject is higher 
as far as the point of view from your camera. It kind of elevates the subject. So a lot of the times when we talk about humanitarian photography or editorial photography, when you're shooting subjects, especially like kids, you want to get really, really low and shoot up, okay, because you want to elevate your subject. Because um, if you reverse that when you're shooting from above, so you're above shooting down at your subject, there's an inferior superiority complex kind of being involved. Again, especially if there's kids or it looks like, you know, a father or a mother looking down at their child, you can really see that the power dynamics of the image um, changes a lot than if you're really low shooting up on them, okay? So generally you shoot from eye level or maybe a little bit above or below, depending on how you want to convey it. Um, but most of the time you're going to shoot from directly on or below, okay? You don't want to shoot above a lot, depending, again, on how you want to portray that subject or what kind of emotion you want to... Uh, to get out of your um, your image. But if you always remember the world is not always at eye level, so don't just be whatever six seven or some six seven five seven to five ten with your camera raised and shooting everything at eye level. Get high, get low, um, and that'll instantly improve your images. Here, straightforward shot, right at eye level, you know there's emotional attachment there. You got the immediacy. She's smiling. Her eyes are there. Um, everything else is kind of adding to whatever the image is going on there. So you can kind of tell what's going on there. She's just, you know, um, enjoyable. It's probably from about three to five feet away. So you're not completely detached, like if you are looking in, um, but you're not really, really close. So you have this really, you know, um, immediacy um, of the image impacting you. Um, so you're kind of like, you know, at a relatively safe distance as far as personal space wise so it just invokes you know a nice happy easy shot here you're further back um, and we'll talk about this shot more in the lighting area but again it's still immediately shot at eye level and all the other things add to the mood um, to the lighting you know her she's a musician she's but you're kind of taken back but even though I'm really further back probably around 15 20 feet shooting with a what they call a moderate telephoto lens, you still have an immediate connection because, again, we're at eye level with the subject. Okay. Here, the background of this story was this guy, I believe, stopped a robbery, shoplifting at a Walmart. So when I got the assignment to, like, meet the guy at 2 o'clock in the afternoon during the harsh sun in front of the Walmart, it's like, oh, great, I get to shoot a guy in front of a... A Walmart that's like the most beautiful background you could possibly have um, but this is it is what it is you know I had to make the most of it because there wasn't any place else that had to go with the story he stopped the shoplifter at the Walmart so you have the Sun you got the American flag waving you know oh that's great you know and so again I shot from below him because you know he was hero like he stopped you know the um, the shop the shoplifting uh, incident so you know I kind of didn't want to cross his hands. I don't like crossing arms, I should say, like that. Um, but there wasn't much else I could kind of do. That's why I always like to have people generally sitting down. Because when they're standing up, you're not doing like a fashion shoot where, you know, like they're fidgeting with their watch or they're like lifting up their collar with the wind blowing, you know, kind of things like that. You're doing an editorial photograph. So at least when they're sitting down, you have more ways to for them to do something with their hands when they're standing up it's like you know it starts to become almost into that fashion model kind of shoot which i didn't you know you don't want to have so the guy's like well fold your hands he was either that or put him into his um pockets which kind of makes him more demured so you know he was a a true american hero he stopped the you know shoplifting and you got the walmart and the flag so i was like cross your arms and we'll talk about this guy a little bit later in the um in the, the lighting situation. I actually, there's two light sources here, but we'll, um, but basically, again, shot from below, okay, so elevating him up into that stature, you know. Here, it's a governor signing a bill. Um, this is a nice way where you can see where if you were just shooting at eye level, standing up while he was signing it, you'd get a pretty boring shot. This is not the greatest shot in the world. It's not gonna win awards, but at least it's a shot from a different point of view. He had the very, very shiny, table there with the glass it was completely clean so i was able to get right down there on the left side of the uh of the crowd so i wasn't blocking anybody so anybody who had to shoot from straight on would be able to get their shot but 
at least it has that extra element of having the reflections, right? So you have everybody smiling, they're clapping, he's smiling, you know, he just signed the papers for this new law, but you have that extra added element of the table in the foreground, and you have that reflection of him. So again, he's almost along that, not too dead center, but a little bit on the left side of the rule of thirds. Um, you have the, you know, the foreground is actually the reflection in the table. The middle ground is him, and the background of the subjects behind it. So it is what it is. It's, you know, a law being signed. One of the most boring things that you have to do almost, you know, every other day if you cover legislature like I do in, uh, in Little Rock. But, you know, you try to take it to that extra level and make something a little bit more interesting. But basically, it's not at eye level. Get down, get from the side, get low, find a different angle, and, you know, it'll make your images a little bit more interesting. Um, so now we're going to get in the lighting. I'm just going to check. I don't see any questions come through. Um, let me just take a sip here. All right, so with lighting, um, please, please, please don't use the pop-up flash. Okay. Um, just don't use it. There's many reasons why I can tell you not to use it, but it, basically when I talk about it later, good when it's good lighting, you can't tell it's there. When you use the pop-up flash, it creates bad lighting. So then your pictures look bad because people can say and see, oh, that's just a really bad flash image. So please just try not to use your pop-up flash. If it's shooting in a dungeon or a really dark room where you need a pop-up flash to light or else you won't be able to get a good shot, obviously you need to use that. But if you're shooting somebody, you're shooting someplace, Try not to use the pop-up flash, okay? Because it makes your images look bad, but then it also kind of blinds everybody else because the flash is directly dead on the subject. It's not a little higher. And if you're ever wondering why you get a lot of red eye with your photographs, that's why, because you're using a pop-up flash. That has something to do with the retina and the angle of the reflection of the flash off the person's eye. So if you want to get rid of a red eye, that's one way. But just please don't try to do it. Please don't use it if you can. Um, with lighting, we're going to talk about two kind of lights, mostly the first part, natural light versus artificial light. Natural light, in usage here, we're talking about the sun. Artificial light is what we're going to be talking about with using a flash or a constant light source, which um, later on I'll do a short demonstration of a light that you can pick up for relatively cheap um, cost that will help your photographs and help your images um, uh, immensely. <clears throat> Natural light is about positioning the subject, okay? When you're working with the sun, obviously you can't move the sun, so you're going to have to move everything else to make it better. So positioning the subject, positioning how they sit, where they sit in relation to where the light's coming in, um, that's what natural light's all about. You can't move the sun, but you can move everything else in for, I guess for the most part, to better use the sun to your advantage. Artificial light, Okay, is about positioning the light. Now, if you combine both, what you can have, you'll see in one of the shots I have, or two of the shots I have, natural and artificial light both working together. So I was able to use position the subject to get one part of the natural light on him, and then I positioned the artificial light to enhance that later on. The easiest way to get more dynamic light is to place the light to the side and above the subject. Now, again, when... I'll get into a little demo where I'll actually use the light on me with the webcam, and you can see what I mean by putting them up to the side and above them. Okay, so we'll get onto that a little bit later. But the best, easiest way to get more dynamic light is to the side and to above. It's never straight on. That's why I said don't use the pop-up flash. You're going to get the worst kind of lighting possible using the pop-up flash. Um, so we're going to get a little bit into light sources not too much, but I have a, excuse me, a good example of um, how you can tell what I'm talking about. So with lighting, is the bigger the light source, the softer the light. Okay. The closer the light source, the softer the light. Now, the easy example, easiest example I can give of this is if you're outside on a bright sunny day. Okay. So the light source is the sun. Bright sunny day, nothing around you. If you look at your shadow you know your shadow is very hard, okay? It's a very distinct shape, has a very sharp edge to it, 
Okay, because the light source is the sun. Now, even though the sun is huge, because it's so far away, in relation to you, it's actually very small. So the bigger the light source, the softer the light. The sun, in relation to you on a sunny day, is very small because it's far away. So your the light is hard. That's where you have that hard edge of your shadow. So let's say if we're on that, and then all of a sudden, some clouds move in. Okay. All of a sudden, even though the sun is your, your light source, it is being modified by the clouds. So if you look at your shadow on a cloudy day, you know that sometimes you can't even see your shadow because it's blended in. The lines are very soft, okay? It's very indistinguishable. Again, because the bigger the light source, now we're talking about the cloud in relation to you, is huge. And now because it's closer, even though the sun is still farther away, the cloud in relation to you is closer, the softer the light. So the bigger the light source, the softer the light. The closer the light source, the softer the light. So the bigger and the closer you can get, the softer your light you can get on your subject. Okay, so the best way, again, the explanation I can give that is with um, the clouds and the sun. Good lighting looks natural. If you look at a photograph and you say, oh, that's really nice image, you won't be saying, oh, he's lit that really awful or the light doesn't look right. You won't see the light. It'll just look like it's part of the image and looks natural. Like I said, when you use that pop-up flash, it makes everything look bad because people are used to seeing bad flash images from that pop-up flash. So when you let it like that, people are like, eh, okay, yeah, I can tell what flash you used because I've used that pop-up flash before on my camera. Okay. Uh, before we get on, I saw another where seems fair to say you hardly ever want your subject dead center in a photo right. Um, I would say no because, again, the rules, if I go, she's, I would say, dead center, but her eyes fall along the rule of thirds, okay? My doctor, if I go back really quick, where'd it go? Um... He's dead center, okay? But, again, his eyes fall on the rule of thirds. This bookshelf, in theory, is actually a rule of thirds naturally because they're dividing the frame up, you know, visually into thirds. Um, so dead center is not bad. Um, but, again, when we were talking about rule of thirds, you want to have the face or the eyes along there. If they're falling, the portraiture, maybe when it doesn't work, would be if the face is like dead center in the portrait, right? She's not completely dead center. She's up a little bit, again, more towards that line. If she was maybe down here, then it would look kind of awkward because, again, you have all that empty space around here that's white. Even if I have all this stuff going on, you have a lot of extra space up above her head that would make it look awkward because her face would be dead center. So she is centered. But her face, again, is long as the rule of thirds. So that was the one question, which was a really good question, um, that you wouldn't want the subject dead center in the photo. Um, the subject can be dead center, but, again, you probably want to make sure that face or the eyes or something of that will be on that top um, part of the rule of thirds. Again, here, she's dead center. The spotlight even makes her dead center. But, again, her eyes and her face are up in the top part of that rule of thirds. So... Dead center is not wrong. You know, the rule of thirds, even though it's called a rule, it's, you know, made for, to be broken. Okay, let's go back. So, yeah, bigger the light source, softer the light. That was a good question, thank you. The closer the light source, the softer the light. And again, good lighting looks natural. It doesn't look like light. You don't say, oh, that's good lighting. You just say, oh, that's a good photograph. You don't notice the lighting because it blends in and makes everything look natural. Um, so when we're talking about light, we talked about him before with composition, now we're talking about him with light. Simple light coming through the side there. It was, um, I believe, a partly cloudy day, because even though you have some soft light falling on him, if you look at the red sofa and a little bit of that wood part there, you can see the hard shadow starting to come through. So I believe it was a partly cloudy day, but because we're inside, that light was filtering through the windows, it became a little softer. So again, 
Soft light, you can see his face. If you look at his face, the lights are very soft. There's not a lot of hard edges that transition, let's say, if you look at um, his upper lip, okay, right, right where the nose is where, you know, his 5 o'clock shadow is, that shadow line is fairly soft. There's not a lot hard line cut into that. And you'll see later on when I talk about a hard line what that is with this. Here, um, you can see it's a very, very hard light, okay? If you look right under her chin, you can see that the delineation from bright to dark is really hard. This, again, because she was a musician, I made it look like that spotlight effect that you would get, so spotlights are very, very small. So I had, again, off to the side and above her, on, I would say if I'm shooting, it would be on my left side, because you can see the shadows are on her right side. But that shadow of her on the wall, you can see there's a very, very hard line. Because, again, the light we were using was a very, very small spotlight. So small light, hard shadows. Here, you can see that the lights are softer, okay? There's a shadow, look, there's a line of shadow, but it's not as hard as, like, you would say from her, okay? Hers is a very distinguishable shadow. His, if you look on the, the wall, the green wall behind him, is, there's a line, but it's a little bit less. Same thing on his face. His face has a little bit, um, I would say, softer shadows. This now, again, was probably the, around the same distance, maybe five to seven feet away from him, just like in the woman, but I had an umbrella, you know, it's called the light umbrella, basically like a rain umbrella. So that size is, you know, maybe three or four feet in circumference. It's a bigger light, softer light, um, compared to what I was using on her. Here was very really simple. Um, they had the interior lights on, those ugly yellow fluorescents. I'm like, can you shut them off? I'm like, sure. So they flipped the switches, and then he also had Venetian blinds to the left of him, to, to his right, to my left. And I'm like, can we close those blinds? They're like, yeah, sure. So they closed the blinds. This was a bright, sunny day, but I turned it into soft light because, I, number one, I turned off the lights up top because we don't talk about color temperature, but you can, you've shot, if you've shot enough photographs with flash or sunlight and inside light, you'll get, you'll see those yellows or greens, everything kind of goes funky in the background um, because you have a different lighting mixture. But I told them specifically I wanted this shot, so I asked them to shut off the top lights, and I also asked them to close the Venetian blinds, and so I turned ugly overhead light and harsh outdoor light into soft light for him. Um, so that's, again, you, you can ask people to do it. They're generally very accommodating. You know, again, you're the photographer. You're the one in charge. This is your shot. You need to do what you need to do. Move something, change something, ask them to do something. Generally, people are, you know, really, um, really eager to help and actually be part of your photo shoot. You know, now you can say, I, I have what's called um, voice-activated light stands, which basically I'll take the PR person and say, hey, can you hold this for me? And they'll be like, yeah, sure. And I'll just direct them and hold them and tell them to do exactly what we want. And you'll see that later on when we uh, go into a little photo session. Here, now we're talking about hard light, okay? So the light was coming into the lobby. It was a bright day, probably, I think, you know, 10 or 11 o'clock in, in the morning. Um, so there was still some angularity to it. But again, I couldn't move the sun. So specifically, I pulled this chair out from another place, rotated around, because I didn't want him, again, Kind of directly looking at me so I rotated him so he can sit on an angle but look directly at me and I use the lines to my advantage I use those hard shadows to my advantage so the lines on the right side are actually kind of pointing you right towards him right they're coming from the right side streaking down to the left side so the lines in the shadow and the light actually direct your eyes to him now this was a raw image so you can tell it's a little bit dark okay the I was when I shoot, you know, I shoot that I assume that I'm going to be processing the image in post. So even though it's a little bit dark, um, I know that I can pull out those details later on. Okay. Um, but, so, yeah, so the harshness doesn't affect me too much because I know I'll clean up his face, pull out a little bit more details um, later on. Here, again, with the lighting, there's two sources of lights. One was the sun behind him, and you can see by the on the his the right side of his face. All right, you have that right side lit up from the sun, and the left side you can see another um, light source coming there. 
you can tell by the shadows, right? His chin has two different uh, light sources and one deep shadow in the center. So I had the my flash on the left side above him shooting down, and I used the sun behind him and above him shooting, um, lighting down there for two different light sources. Okay. Excuse me. Now I saw one question came in. Can you share advice about taking photos inside a conference room with no natural lighting? Uh, um, yeah, I like to say gear doesn't matter, um, but there's and there's very but there's very few times where gear does matter. If there's no natural lighting, that means there's still some kind of lighting generally coming from the fluorescence. If it's just a conference room like we're known, and they have overhead fluorescence. Um, there's nothing you can do, right? I mean, if the lights are turned up all the way, that's all there is. That's where those more expensive cameras and those big white lenses you see everybody use. That's where that's what allows them to get a clearer, better shot. Um, if you can't do that, and then you're stuck with the pop-up flash, and like I said, I don't want you to use it, but that would be a, a time when, yeah, you'd have to use the pop-up flash. But if you're, if it's like a press conference or you're in a conference room and you're way back, probably more than 15, 20 feet, that pop-up flash is completely useless. That's when you'd have to use those bigger flashes you see that will put on top of the camera. That way, that will be able to throw the light. So if you want to shoot a speaker and it's in a conference room with bad lighting, the only thing I could say would be, sneak up real quick on the left or right side, get as close as you can, pop off one or two shots, and move back. There's nothing else you can do about it, um, unless you have the money to spend to buy those expensive gear. So, again, that's a, if, you're, um, if you're shooting with an iPhone, yeah, <laughs> ain't nothing you can do, sorry. Um, but, yeah, the question was advice about taking photos inside a conference room with no natural lighting. Um, yeah, you're fighting physics there um, unless you have the expensive gear um, there's not much you can do just get as close as you can maybe like right when they start speaking run up there snap five or six photos so you don't bother a lot of people and then just back off you know or when they're right near the end if there's applause um, you know obviously you don't want to try to bother somebody during the talk if that's what it is or during the conference so yeah just run up real quick you know be a bother to everybody for 10 seconds shoot one two three four five shots and then just get away that's the only real advice I can give you unless, other than spending, you know, a lot of money for um, better equipment. Uh, that was a great question. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's nothing you can do unless you want to spend money or be a little obnoxious. Um, all right, so let's go on. Uh, so for posing, okay, so we talked about lighting. We talked about um, composition. Talked about posing. Not much is here as far as posing, except I always like to go the order of light, place, person. Okay, if we go back one, or two, I should say, light, I couldn't control my light, but I knew where the light was coming in. Place, I found a place where I really wanted to put him in, using that light. So the light dictated where the place was, and then the person. So I had the light coming in from the right, it was very harsh, but they were making these nice lines. So I took a chair, placed it there, right in that spot, and then even when he sat down, I, I know for sure to make sure the light hit him in the right place because I didn't want a lot of shadow, one of those lines cutting through his face. You can see it cut through maybe the top part of his head and then it cut through right on the, the top part of his tie there. Um, but it didn't cut through right through his face. His face was just in, was lit from the, the light. So I'm sure I didn't get that right on the first. So I'm like, oh, can you scoot up a little bit or can we just move it back? or a little bit forward, so I made sure when he sat down, you know, I put his head in that one. So light, where does your light coming from, how you can see, where does it fall, then the place, where are you going to shoot using that light, and then you put the person in there. So that's the easiest place as far as um, posing. Test and talk, and what do I mean by test and talk? Again, you're probably going to have to test a little time, um, a few times, take a few different test shots to see where the light is falling, to test your exposure to test to see, okay, where the light's falling, how's he looking, or she's looking. Um, this will allow them to get relaxed in front of the camera, especially if they're not used to being photographed. Um, sometimes you can find good, natural, and comfortable poses, you know, when they're like, they might just relax their arms and find a nice, comfortable pose. You're like, oh, that's great. But then when you say, okay, we're ready, they might move their hands and go back to something that doesn't look right. You're like, oh, no, what are you just doing right there? Just just go back, relax. Yeah, put your arms, yeah, that's exactly perfect. Yeah, don't 
don't move, don't do anything like that, because they're not expecting you to shoot during that test time. You can actually look and see how they react when they're in a more natural um, environment rather than, you know, tensing up and their butt cheeks clenched because you're about to take a photo of them. Um, and you can get sometimes some unexpected or unscripted moments when you're running tests. So when I mean running tests, I mean actually shoot. But tell them, I'm just going to run some tests for my lights and exposure, so you just sit there, relax, and don't worry about me. And then I'll normally shoot maybe five or ten shots before I say, okay, look at me, or okay, this is what I want to do, and change it up from there. See? Um, close hair, chin, arm back. <laughs> That's basically what you try, I tr or I try to look for. Um, while you're shooting the subject, their clothes, make sure there's not a collar up, there's not a button undone, you know, fly or whatever, um, zipper is coming down. Hair, you know, you got to make sure the hair is um, in the right place, not coming down, not, you know, split ends, frizzing up behind the ear, things like that. Behind, generally you like to put a little bit um, down over the shoulder rather than all of it behind. Um, again, depends on the person and the hair. Uh, chins are sometimes a problem. You'll see in this next shot with this gentleman. Um, he is very old and his you know chin was sagging. So you have to tell him, you know, oh, push your chin out like a turtle. It, it doesn't feel right, but it'll look right. So when you say, you know, push it out like a turtle coming out of a shell, push your head forward like that. If they do that, it'll stretch out the skin and get rid of that chin. Um, again, the arms, you got to be careful where you place the arms, you know, depending on... Um, how they look um, sitting up or, you know, sitting down against a chair, you know, the arm flapping somewhere. Um, and then a the back generally you want to have them, you know, straight back so that always, that'll prop them up and things like that. And again, you want to turn them. You don't always want them, doesn't mean you can't have them straight on looking at you, but you can see with most of those shots they were turned um, at some angle and then looking back at the camera. Um, let's see, I've got a couple more questions. Uh, when outside, is it okay to put the? Here's a question from somebody. When outside, is it okay to put the subjects completely in the shade? If the natural lighting is on the side of them, I often have to take pictures of people at noon, where my choices are either in a conference room or outside. Yeah, if um, you can, you want to. It's better if you can move them in all shade. Okay, um, I know sometimes it's going to be hard because it could be in shade or. You might be like under a tree, but then you have a lot of brightness around them. Um, what you got to do is maybe you want to have them in shade, but you also want to have the background more importantly, in, mostly in shade. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, if there's something important that you have to put behind them, stick them outside. I'm trying to think if I have any uh, good subjects of outside on a bright sunny day. I probably didn't put those in. Yeah, I, I didn't put any of those in really because um, they're not the great example. But yeah, if you want to get them into the shade because then they're not going to be squinting. That's the most important one. If it's outside in direct noonday, they're always going to be squinting and then you can't see their faces. Um, so yeah, you want to move them into the into the shade. And then generally, um, you know, maybe find some steps or a bench, something, you know, smoking area is always sometimes in shades. So I found a lot of times when you're working outside a building. Um, if you have to shoot them outside because there's something in the background, there's, you know, not much you can do about that. You can buy aftermarket things, you know, like what's called the diffuser. is basically like a big bed sheet with a metal ring around it that you can hold over their head. So that becomes like that cloud I was talking about that softens the light falling onto them. Um, but if you can't, yeah, if you're just stuck with the bright sunny day, at least try to get them into the shade. That's all I can I can pretty much say. The harsh light is mostly because it makes them squint. Um, so the shade natural lighting, again, if they're outside, yeah, people at noon, and you have a conference room or outside, I would probably shoot outside and just find a nice shady spot. Hopefully there's a tree um, or a fountain, you know, um, even like the side of a building. If they're leaning up on the side of a building, you know, you have the repetition somewhere, like kind of like behind them with the side of the building. But there's not much um, you can do. Uh, let's see, we've got another quick question. Is there an easy way for us to do off-camera flash? Yes, I will get to that. Um, on conferences, you have no real option about spending on gear. What you're making in terms of focal length and speed is a very basic bit of gear. Um, if you're talking about conferences and you're talking about generally you're back on risers and there's a speaker on the other end of the conference room. Um, the standard 
option is a 7200 um, 2.8 lens. If you throw that on any of those, you know, even 300, 500, 600 dollar point and shoot cameras, uh, the 7210 will help you get more range to pull in that speaker closer. Um, it is expensive, uh, probably two thousand dollars for a brand new Canon or Nikon one. You, you, excuse me, you can cut off if you go to an off-brand Sigma or Tamron. You can probably get one for about a thousand. If you go used and maybe find something that's a little older, you might be able to squeeze out a used one for maybe five hundred to seven hundred fifty dollars. But focal length will probably be seventy two hundred. The camera does help too, but if the camera, I would say, is no more than two or three years old, if you go to ISO 3200 or 6400, it should be usable. Okay. When I'm in those situations, generally I have a 7200. My ISO is very high at 3200 or 6400. Um, and I'm probably still on manual exposure because when you're dealing with crazy lights like that, automatic might not work. I wish I could have more time to get into that, but we're kind of running out. Uh, but yeah, that's what I can say about about that. Uh, okay, so we've got about posing. Um, I can sh I'll go through the shoot run through really in two or three minutes, and if we have questions, we can do that because um, that's basically it. So this was a typical biz portrait. Um, I spent 15 minutes in a boring office setting with the PR department hovering. This is a rough edit. This is the good, the bad, and ugly. All the shots that I took during um, the shoot, and so I just want to give you an idea of what. Um, you can see what I kind of did as my process of working through it. So this guy, this is my gear. You can see I have an off-camera flash, my two cameras with the lenses, and that little diffuser, that little white thing, again, that's my diffuser. If you get it close enough, you can get some pretty good lights. That's what I did on some of the other shots you saw. Um, oh, yeah, they have this painting that's really important to the CEO. Can you do it? Uh, yeah, okay, fine. I always say yes. It doesn't mean I want to do it or I'll shoot it, but if they ask me to do something just to please them, I'll shoot it. So, yeah. All right, I'm doing some tests. Just relax. All right, yeah, look this way. Smile. You can smile. I know you can smile. Go on that. Try to do a vertical. Give the designer a little bit of look. I went to that one a little bit lower. Try to get the reflection like I did before. It just wasn't working. I did not like this shot, but I just did it anyway to please them. Okay, you can smile again. This guy would never smile. I like to have him smiling at least in a few shots. Then we went over to this door with the, the name of the um, company on there. And so I tried shooting him. Again, that's where we're talking about the highlights in the back. Um, yeah, it didn't quite work. Tried a different angle. No, that didn't work. Backed out. Okay, it's not too bad. Nope, don't put him in the center. And here you can see the one before my depth of field was really shallow, so you couldn't see the letters anyway, so I increased my aperture to allow a bit more depth of field, so now you can actually read the letters, but still, it's blocking too much of his face. Here, it wasn't kind of too bad there. I was like, all right, at this point, I was like, eh, this is not working. Let's move to something else. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we have these trees. Our theme is you know, it's about the rainforest. Can you shoot with these trees? Yes, PR marketing lady, I shall shoot with the trees, even though I have trees have nothing to do with this guy, really, but... Let's shoot the trees. All right, just relax. I'm going to do some tests. Again, he's standing. I can't find really good poses. What to do? Put it in your hand. If you look at it, it doesn't look right. You know, it just looks kind of awkward. Oh, put your hands together. It, it just, you know, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel natural. And then here I was lighting, with, lighting here with a flash. You can see on the right side there was natural light coming in from the window. On the left side, you can see where's that magic light coming from. You can see it here. And... Here was a PR lady helping me out, okay? So again, all I did was just cut her off, focus on this right side of the part. But I was like, hey, can you hold up? Can you open this flat, hold this for me? And I'm like, she's like, sure. I'm like, hold it up higher, higher, higher. Okay, point it down at him, moving a little bit closer. I was directing her, my voice-activated light stand, to uh, doing that. So I got that. We were walking back, and I was like, oh, I saw the, the sign again, but with the light in the background. I kind of like this, step up next to it. Here, I didn't mind it, but you can see in the background, the top right, there's that white part. Um, there's the light. Eventually, after two or three shots, I moved it. I finished that up. I saw this earlier, and I was like, let's move back inside. There was a, a woman there who was packing it up. I'm like, okay, let's put you down here. I put them down here. Again, by cleaning it up, I moved a couple of things around to make it more natural. That one thing was blocking the hands. It was too messy. So, 
just like the question with the desk before the computer, I cleaned it up a little bit. Shot here, shot lower, then like the position, again, he's just relaxing. I moved over to the side, and then I thought we were done. His position for this, I thought was really nice, and I told him, don't move. I moved back, okay, and now you can see he's got that more relaxed position, which was from here, but not with his hands folded. He moved his position here, but then I went back and shot this shot, and then I was like, hold on one second, I need to shoot this iPhone for this uh, seminar I was doing. All you do is back up a little bit, this is the same shot, except with my iPhone. So again, you don't need a fancy camera, there's not much difference between shooting with my expensive camera and shooting with my iPhone. It was still more about composition, foreground, middle ground, background, right, rule of thirds. He was kind of dead center, but again, a lot of this stuff, you know, balanced him out that way. Um, and they still ran this one. I don't know why, you know, it's like if you give... Five or six shots, the designer is going to take the one you don't like and run it big. And this was the other one I didn't like either that they ran <laughs> as well. Yeah, go figure. I mean, I don't have control over it, but um, I don't know if you want me to go on or wait. And um, just about past time, um, I just had a smartphone shooting tip, but it's up to you as to far as we can continue for another five minutes. Sure, now. I think it would be fine to, to, you know, to spend the next five minutes kind of wrapping up. I think that would be fine. Okay, um, well, I can probably spend one or two minutes just on the smartphone shooting. That, sure. That's kind of what, you know, will help. And then if you have any questions, yeah, that sounds great. Ask. Um, all right, so with smart... All right, great, cool. Um, so with smartphone shooting, again, there's not much you can re do with your smartphone. You don't have a lot of control over it. But refer back to the lighting and the composition. Remember, you can place your subject in the right position where you don't have to worry too much about the light, about the comp, you know, about what it's doing or how to fill it. Lighting and composition. Move everything else so that way you can shoot the way you want to. Do not use the new portrait feature on your iPhone. Okay, and that's more for ethical reasons. Um, when you talk about portraiture, with my with expensive cameras, you know how you can do that shot where you have the face and everything else is blurry, like the doctor. You know, I was able to blur out the background. That new iPhone portrait feature does that but not naturally through the lens it does that like if you're using Photoshop so for ethical reasons I wouldn't use that because you're not creating a photo you're creating an illustration because it's actually being doctored so just be careful with that new portrait feature on the iPhone that's what I wanted to say it looks nice but I wouldn't call it a photograph I'd call it an illustration because you're actually manipulating the background post photograph uh, crop don't zoom Okay, so you have that zoom feature in the phone. Do not use it because with the zoom feature, you're actually cutting out quality in a way that's not good for the image. With cropping, you're cutting out stuff that's already there, but it's not as detrimental to the image as zooming is. So crop the photograph. So meaning if you need a, only a small section, take the photo and just crop it, cut it later on. Don't zoom into there. Sneaker zoom is okay. And what do I mean by sneaker zoom? Just walk up. <laughs> walk up or walk back, walk forward or walk back, that's a zooming, okay? So if you can get close to the subject, get closer. If you can't, you know, don't. Um, exposed for the face, um, we'll talk about the little sun, uh, sun slider a little on. And the only app I use for editing on your iPhone is Snapseed. That can do just about everything. You can just use a regular camera app, but afterwards Snapseed is free, I believe, from Google. They bought it. Um, and it's a really powerful app, and it's really easy and intuitive to get through. Um, so I would use Snapseed for all my editing. It really helps pulling up highlights and shadows. Um, that iPhone slider I'm talking about is here. So if you put it on the face, you can move that little sun up and down. Okay, so that'll make it darker or lighter. Because you can see, again, I exposed for his face here, but that background around him really got blown out. That's okay because you want to expose for the face. If I exposed for the background, he would be completely dark. Okay. So that's what I meant for exposed for the space and use that slider. If I didn't use that slider, in my, or if I was shooting this with an iPhone and didn't use that slider to make it brighter, his face would be really dark. Okay, uh, any questions? I'll leave it on that. People can look. Okay, Mike. All done. Okay, um, and Crystal, I don't know if there are any more questions in the queue, or we may have covered them all. Yes, we got them all. Okay. Yes, we got them all.
Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you, Mitch. A sincere thank you to Mitch. This has been a really fantastic presentation with some wonderful pictures, I might add. Um, so thank you very much, Mitch. Um, really appreciate all the effort that you put into it. No problem. And, uh, we can do a video one maybe in the future because um, that's probably one that yeah, I no, that would be as well. So, um, but yeah. And, and to our members, um, if you have any suggestions about future training topics, uh, feel free to email Cebu at Cebu.org and uh, keep an eye on your email for information about the February session. But uh, aside from that, I think that concludes today's call. Thank you again, Mitch. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one thing, if they do have other questions, you know, sure. um, I don't know if you can stick my email address somewhere, you know. Feel free and actually, them. Mitch, I didn't yeah. know if you might be able to share your slides with Crystal so that we could post them on the website along with the recording of the call. Would that be possible? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah, that you. would be great. Thank you. Well, thanks again, everyone. Thank you.